On August 15, 1997, Peter Brooks and his girlfriend Karen Hall went to the Eagle Cap Wilderness to spend a quiet weekend. Karen never made it back. Fifteen years later, Peter finally broke his silence and told the chilling story of what happened that weekend to the LeGrand, Oregon Police Department. It was supposed to be one of the best days of my life, a day I would remember forever. I was going to ask the love of my life, Karen, to marry me. What happened on that day, though, was something that will haunt my soul for as long as I'm breathing. Karen and I had been dating for three years, since we were both 23 years old. We both knew after a few months we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. The only thing that was missing was I hadn't formally asked her to marry me yet. Even though she'd been pushing and prodding me for quite some time to ask her. She didn't know though the reason I hadn't asked was because for the last year I'd been saving up enough money to buy her the wedding ring she'd always dreamed about. She'd always loved jewelry and talked about how much she loved pink diamonds and dolphins. So I wanted to buy her a custom made ring with dolphins and the biggest pink diamond I could afford on my apprenticeship salary. Pink diamonds are the most expensive diamonds, so I'd been working hard and scrimping to buy her the best I could. Finally, after a year of hard work and being frugal, I was able to go down to our local jeweler and order her a custom made ring. I'd never felt such accomplishment in my life. I was sure she would be ecstatic with the ring. I loved her very much and wanted the best for her. After several weeks, the ring was completed, and I decided I wanted to do something special for her when I popped the question, and asked her to be my bride, and showed the ring to her for the first time. We both loved going camping a lot during the summer, and being it was August and the weather was still good, I decided to plan a weekend getaway. One of our favorite areas to go camping was deep in the heart of the mountains of the Eagle Cap National Forest. This area is famous for being out in the middle of nowhere, which is the way we liked it. We loved being alone with just us and nature and no one else. We'd camped in Eagle Cap many times before, but we always liked to try new areas every time we went. Eagle Cap National Forest was huge, and we wanted to see as much of it as possible. We were adventurous and loved discovering new places we'd never seen before. When Friday afternoon finally came, we loaded up our camping gear like we'd done so many times before and set off for a weekend wilderness retreat. Unbeknownst to her, a special surprise awaited. As we were driving along the paved mountain road that would take us into Eagle Cap, I leaned over and asked her which area she'd like to camp this time once we got there. She thought for a moment and then said, Do you remember that fork in the road when we head to Ice Lake? I say we take the left fork this time and see where it takes us. Sure thing, I bet there are some cool spots to camp there, I replied. I didn't mention it, but when she said that, a bad feeling came over me. And in my mind I was thinking, well, what in the hell is this feeling? After a minute or so, I just blew it off as nothing and continued driving. I mean, what could it be anyways? I was probably just nervous about proposing to her, since I'd never done anything like it before. We drove for several more hours, ate some snacks, chatted about work and our families, nothing of great importance. When the left fork came into view and I saw the sign for Ice Lake, I angled the steering wheel of the car to the left, and as I did, a little voice inside my head was saying, no, don't go this way. Turn around. This time a chill went up my spine and my whole body shook like I'd just experienced a shiver from being too cold. Karen looked over at me, noticed I'd shivered, and asked, Are you okay, honey? Oh yeah, I'm fine. Not sure why I shivered, I said with a slight chuckle, trying to lighten the mood a bit. Once we hit the road on the left fork, it instantly turned into a dirt road that was very bumpy. I could tell not too many people use this road. 
It was not well maintained by the Forest Service like most of the roads we would usually drive on in the Eagle Cap. Karen looked over at me and said with a laugh, Wow, maybe I shouldn't have picked this place. This road is horrible. I didn't say anything. I just tried to laugh a little. I didn't want to tell her about the bad feeling I'd gotten because I wanted this weekend to be perfect. I wanted the atmosphere to be happy, not worrisome. We continued driving for another hour before the road came to a dead end. I stopped the car and said, well, that's it. That's as far as we can go. It looks like we can set up camp almost anywhere around here, and there's plenty of dead trees and branches to make a nice fire. She looked at me and smiled and said, this is great. I'm just glad we don't have to drive anymore. I don't think my butt and back can take it. I smiled back and said, I hear that. As I shot off the car, it was then I noticed just how dark it really was. The forest was super thick with pine trees, as are most of the forest in the Eagle Cap, and there wasn't going to be a moon until the following day. This meant it was pitch black. It was like this a lot when we would go camping, but for some reason it felt eerie tonight, like something was off. I turned my thoughts back to Karen and the task at hand, so I grabbed my flashlight from the center console, turned it on, and said, Let's set up camp and cook dinner. I'm starved. Sounds good to me, honey. I'm starving too. I don't like setting up camp in the dark, but I guess there's nothing we can do about that now, replied Karen. I just nodded my head as I opened the car's door and stepped outside into the dark. As I stepped outside, I noticed it was cold, much colder than I expected it would be for being August. I stopped moving for a second and I could hear the sound of a roaring river and knew that was one reason for it being colder than usual. It's always colder when you're close to a river. I made my way to the back of the car and started unloading our camping gear. I think we should set up the tent first, then make a fire and cook dinner, I said. Sounds like a plan to me, replied Karen. We had a two-man tent that was quick and easy to set up, so it didn't take long to set up and throw our sleeping bags and mats inside. Once we finished setting up the tent, we started gathering firewood for the fire. We liked cooking our dinner over an open fire. We had talked several times before about how it gave us the sense and feeling we were going back to our roots as humans, our ancestors, who used to cook over an open fire. This was probably another reason we liked camping as well. We loved tapping into our primal instincts. Real life can get lost and confusing living in a big city surrounded by technology, and camping seemed to keep us grounded and at peace. It didn't take us long to gather enough firewood to build a huge fire. Normally we have to go on a scavenger hunt for wood because of other people who camp as well and use up all of the wood like we do. This place was different though. It was everywhere. It was as if no one else had ever camped here before. At first I thought, wow, this is nice. I won't have to search far for wood. A few minutes later though, as I was gathering firewood, an eerie feeling came over me that maybe there was a reason no one camped here. Maybe it was just the nasty road we drove on to get here, I told myself as I continued gathering wood for the fire. This helped set my mind at ease a little, but not much. Once we finished gathering as much wood as we could each carry, we made a fire pit out of some big rocks that were close by. Since we'd built many fires over the last few years together, it didn't take us long to have a roaring fire in front of us, which was greatly welcome since it was cold, and it also gave us a sense of security. There's something about a fire that gives humans a comforting sense of security. Maybe we believe it keeps dangerous animals away, or maybe we're tapping into our ancient instincts. Whatever it is, it's a nice feeling. When the fire started to die down a little, I said to Karen, 
Hey, let's start cooking dinner. I'm starved. Yeah, me too. Let's get it going, she replied. As I was walking back to the car, which was about 40 yards away from our tent and the fire, I heard a clicking noise coming from the nearby trees, and the sound seemed to be moving around rather than from a stationary position. It was a wet clicking sound. Click, click, click. It suddenly stopped, and I could hear something moving swiftly through the trees. It seemed to be moving away from me as I walked closer to the car. I immediately froze in place from fear and thought, what in the holy hell is that? I looked back at Karen, who was standing by the fire getting warm. She had her back turned to me, and I could tell she hadn't heard what I'd heard, which makes sense since a fire is loud from the sound of wood crackling. I stood there for several minutes frozen solid in place, unable to move before Karen said, Are you okay? What's taking so long? Nothing, just trying to find everything, I replied. Again, I didn't want to alarm her and ruin the mood of what was supposed to be an unforgettable weekend. I opened the trunk of the car, grabbed the food and the cooking supplies we'd need to cook over an open fire, and walked back to Karen's side. I handed her the food as I took the fire grill out of its nylon sleeve and set it down over the fire so we could cook the steaks we'd bought from the local market in town. We always bring some kind of meat for dinner and eggs and bacon for breakfast. Again, we loved enjoying the feeling of being primal and returning to our roots, if only for a few short days a couple of times a month. I took the steaks out of their packaging and slapped them down on the grill. They immediately started sizzling as a fire seared the outside of the steaks. I reached into the bag that had the cooking supplies, grabbed the seasoning we like to use, and sprinkled it over our steaks. The smell of sizzling steaks filled the air as I breathed it in. I love the smell of steaks cooking over an open fire, and so did Karen. She leaned in and took a good whiff and said, Oh, those sure smell good. We'd also brought some potatoes and peppers, so I sliced those up and threw them on the grill as well. As I sat there cooking the food, the eeriness and sounds I'd heard earlier escaped my mind, and I was relaxed for the first time since we'd hit the left fork of the road. While I was cooking, Karen had gone back to the car to grab our camping chairs so we could both sit and watch the food cook over the fire. We were both at ease and happy to be in each other's company as we sat there holding hands and exchanging glances. Once the steaks and vegetables finished cooking, we pulled them off the grill. We talked and laughed as we sat there eating the delicious dinner we'd just cooked. Again, my mind had forgotten the uneasiness and fear I'd felt earlier. After we finished eating, Karen reached down into her knapsack and grabbed out a bottle of wine and some glasses. We liked drinking red wine when we ate red meat, and of course, it's fun to get tipsy together. Karen poured us each a glass, and we said cheers as we clanked our glasses together. Right then it hit me, and I remembered the whole reason I planned this weekend was to propose to her. I'd been keeping the ring in my pocket the whole time since we left, and I wasn't sure how she didn't notice the bulge protruding from my pocket. Also, right then the fear and excitement of proposing to her hit me like a brick and I started panicking. What's wrong? You've been acting squirrely ever since we arrived here, she asked. I looked up from my glass of wine and said, Oh, it's nothing. This place just kind of gives me the creeps, that's all. My mind went back to proposing and I started telling myself maybe it would be better to propose tomorrow. Honestly, there was no rush, as we were planning on being here for two nights, so I had plenty of time. Thinking that helped me relax a little, and I finished drinking the last of the wine from my glass. I handed her the glass and asked, May I have some more, madam? You most certainly may, sir, she replied with a giggle. We sat there for another hour drinking and talking as we got drunk. When my head started bobbing back and forth as I tried not falling asleep, I decided it was time to hit the hay. 
I looked over at Karen, who was passed out in her camping chair, and said, Karen, honey, let's go to bed. I stood up and grabbed her arm as she murmured something. I knew we were both pretty tipsy, and the best thing for us would be to go straight to bed. I helped her out of the chair, and we both stumbled over to the tent. I reached down and grabbed the zipper, opening the door to the tent. Karen immediately flopped down on the floor of the tent with a laugh. I started laughing too as I fumbled my way into the tent. Once I was all the way inside, I zipped up the tent's door and unrolled the sleeping bags. I helped Karen get inside her bag and put her head on her pillow. I turned to climb into my bag and as I did, I could hear Karen already snoring, which didn't surprise me as I whispered to myself with a slight chuckle. She never did handle alcohol well. One glass is enough to put her right to sleep in minutes. Now it was my turn, I thought, as my head hit the pillow and I was out like a light, as I started navigating my way through the dreamland of my mind. I remember having the strangest of dreams, dreams like I'd never had before, dreams I couldn't explain. It was like trying to explain the strangest movie you've ever seen. You could never do it justice. You just have to see it for yourself to understand. I woke up the next morning to the sun hitting the tent and sweat rolling down my forehead. My head was pounding like someone was playing the drums in my brain. Red wine always gave me a bad hangover and this was no different. Karen was still asleep next to me, snoring away like she always did when she drank too much. I laid there for I don't know how long, my head throbbing in pain, before Karen rolled over and slowly started to wake up. She looked up at me and said, You been awake long? Not long, but my head hurts something fierce. I don't know why in the hell I drink red wine. It always gives me the worst headaches, I responded. Karen smirked and said, You drink it because I like it, silly. Oh yeah, I said with a chuckle as I massaged both my temples with my fingers, trying to stop the throbbing pain. Well, let's get up and eat something. That'll help your hangover, she said. Good idea. I feel like my head is going to explode, I responded. It didn't take us long to get up and out of the tent. Being it was warm in the day, we weren't tempted to stay in our sleeping bags like we do when it's cold outside. Hangovers always suck ass, and every time I get one I promise myself I'm never going to drink again. That is, until I'm offered another drink. As those thoughts went through my mind, I laughed at myself. After breakfast, we spent the day exploring the area, being this was new to the both of us. Or so I thought. As the day progressed, though, Karen's attitude slowly started to change, and she became more and more distant. I spent most of the day trying to figure out in my head if I'd done something wrong, and if I did, what I did wrong. No matter how hard I tried to figure it out, I just couldn't place one specific thing on something I'd done. I thought maybe it was just a woman thing, or maybe it was because I hadn't proposed yet. I ran every scenario through my head that day, but I came up with nothing. As the evening started to settle in, she was almost completely quiet and cold to me. At that point, I stopped asking her questions and just went about cooking dinner trying to act like nothing was wrong, even though something was clearly wrong with her. As we were sitting there by the fire, she suddenly got up without saying a word and walked straight to the tent, unzipped it, and went inside. I immediately thought, well, what in the hell is going on with her? I sat there in the camping chair for a few more minutes and thought, well, I might as well go to bed. My brain was tired from thinking and worrying too much about her. I thought maybe a good night's sleep will help. I stood up and walked over to the tent and peered inside and could see she was already in her sleeping bag and was facing away from me. I didn't say a word. I just climbed into the tent, zipped it up, and got into my sleeping bag. 
I turned away from her as well and quickly fell asleep. I'm not sure how long I'd been asleep, but I was awoken to the sound of click, click, click. I immediately sat up in a panic. I looked over at Karen, and to my surprise, she wasn't there. Only her empty, half-open sleeping bag. I then looked over at the tent door, and it was still zipped up. I thought, how in the hell did she unzip the tent, then zip it up without me hearing it? I've always been a light sleeper, and I didn't drink any alcohol tonight, so I shouldn't have been in that deep of a sleep. As I was thinking about where she could be, I heard the clicking sound again, only this time it had a loud, wet sound to it. Click. 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 This time my heart started to race, and I felt a surge of fear and adrenaline race through my body. I thought about calling out to Karen, but I was too scared, and I thought there's no way she could be making that noise. Then it hit me. Maybe she really is just going to the bathroom. Why would she zip the tent back up, though? We always leave it unzipped if we go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. We know we'll be quick, and it's a pain in the ass to zip it up, then unzip it again. I wasn't sure how long I sat there trying to decide what to do. It felt like forever, though. After a few minutes, I decided to lay back down on my sleeping bag and wait to see what happens next to see if she was in fact going to the bathroom. I must have dozed off because I was awoken to the hideous sound of my name being screamed over and over again. Peter, Peter, Peter. Karen, is that you? I shouted out. You need to get out of here now. They're watching you. They're coming for you. Get out of here now, she said. Without thinking, I immediately jumped up, unzipped the tent, and ran straight for the car. As I was running, I could faintly see Karen in the trees, but it was hard to make her out. I could also hear things moving swiftly through the trees, and again the wet, clicking sound. It grew louder and louder as the things in the trees got closer. As I was within a few feet of the car, I remembered the car keys were on the dashboard, which is where we usually leave them when we go camping, so we don't lose them. I didn't hesitate as I opened the car's door and jumped into the front seat. I quickly fumbled to hit the automatic lock and kept missing the button. A shot of fear went up my spine and after several attempts I finally found the button. As all the locks clicked simultaneously, I breathed a sigh of relief. As I turned around to see where Karen was, something hit the side of the car with a loud thud, moving the rear end of the car several feet. I shouted out in panic. What the hell was that? It was then I saw Karen, clearly in the moonlight, and calmly walking over to the car. She was naked and covered in blood. I looked at her in horror as she got closer to the car. When she got close, I yelled as loud as I could, Karen, what is going on? Why the hell are you covered in blood? She just stood there looking at me without uttering a word. Her eyes looked lifeless, like a doll's eyes. You brought me back to my home, and they came for me. I can never leave. You must leave now and never return, or they'll kill you, she said. What will kill me? What are you talking about? I screamed as tears started rolling down my cheeks. Right then, several dark figures not too far behind Karen stood up and were looking straight at me. They were huge, at least seven or eight feet tall. Peter, leave now, I beg you, she screamed. I hurriedly grabbed the keys off the dash and started the car, jammed it into drive as fast as I could, and put the pedal to the metal. As I drove away, leaving a cloud of dust behind the car, I could see Karen in my rearview mirror watching me as I left. There were at least a dozen dark figures half surrounding her. I raced down the mountain as fast as the car could go. What had just happened didn't seem real to me, 
As I drove home, I kept trying to process it all, but I just couldn't. I wasn't sure what to say or how I was going to explain this to anyone. I simply couldn't tell anyone, and I knew I would get blamed for her disappearance. As my home came into sight, I made a split decision. I knew deep down I had to run and stay on the run. I turned the car around and sped off, and I've been running ever since. What happened up there in Eagle Cap that night haunts me every day of my life, and I don't venture into the mountains anymore. Maybe someday I'll go back, maybe, but not just yet. For more scary horror stories, subscribe now.